Before we begin, I'd like to briefly mention and thank those people who made this possible tonight. Most all of the organizational work was done by the student chapter of the ACM. And specifically, I'd like to thank Nathaniel Swartz and Andrew Harris. Andrew. <laughs> Thanks also goes out to Deanna Pace and Dr. Najarian in the CS department for their work. And a special thanks to Carlisle Childress for hosting our guest for the party. So that's uh, uh, thank you. He's the uh, selling the <laughs>
freedom. One is the freedom to study the source code of the program and change it so the program does what you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to help your neighbor. That is the freedom to make and distribute exact copies to others when you wish. And that can include giving them away or, or selling them as you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to contribute to your community. That's the freedom to make and distribute copies of your modified versions when you wish. <coughs> Each of these is a freedom, not an obligation. You're not required to do any of these four things, but you're free to do them and in all of them when you wish. So if the program gives you these four freedoms, then it is free software, meaning that the social system of the program's distribution and use is an ethical system. But if one of these freedoms is missing or insufficient, then the program is user subjugating proprietary software because the social system of its distribution and use is an unethical system. So the development of a proprietary program is not a contribution to society, it's a power grab. And it's better to develop nothing than to develop proprietary software. And the aim of the free software movement is therefore all users should always have these four freedoms when they use software. All software should be free. But why are these four freedoms essential? Why define free software based on these four freedoms? Each freedom has a reason. Freedom two, the freedom to help your neighbor, the freedom to distribute exact copies to others, is essential on basic moral grounds. <clears throat> so that you can live an ethical, upright life as a good member of your community. If you use a program without freedom too, then you're in danger of falling into a moral dilemma at any moment whenever your friend says, that program is nice, could I have a copy? At that moment, you will face a choice between two evils. One evil is to give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program. The other evil is to deny your friend a copy and comply with the license of the program. Once you're in a dilemma, you want to choose the lesser evil, which is to give your friend a copy and buy <laughs> <laughs>
That's my solution. If somebody offers me a program, no matter how many can be, how convenient it might be to use, on conditions that I not share it, I say no. I say your program is appealing, but you're asking me to do something unethical to accept it, and I won't do that. So get your dirty program out of here. <clears throat> so you too should reject software that you're not allowed to share because to accept it, to accept that condition would be a betrayal of your community and it would put you in a situation where sooner or later the dilemma is going to happen. And you shouldn't accept or imitate <coughs> the propaganda terms that proprietary software developers use to try to demonize the act of cooperation with your community. So don't let them lead you into using the term piracy to refer to sharing. If somebody asks me what I say, what I think about piracy, I say attacking ships is very bad. <laughs> but they don't do it with computers. So there's no such thing as software piracy. They're, they're, if you want a neutral term for forbidden copying, you can call it forbidden copying. And I prefer to call it forbidden sharing. So that's the reason for freedom too. The freedom to help your neighbor. The freedom to make and distribute exact copies of the program when you wish. <clears throat> freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. That's essential for a totally different reason. So you can control your computing. There are proprietary programs that, bizarre as this might seem, restrict the use of app of the authorized copies. They may restrict on which computer it can be run, or on with what other software, or by whom, or for how long, or for what purpose. And this is obviously not having control of your computer. So freedom zero is essential. But it's not enough, because that's just a freedom to do or not do whatever the program is already written to do. So the developer still has power over you no longer through the license of the program, but instead through the code of the program. The developer gets to decide what you can or can't do. So you also need freedom one, the freedom to study the source code and change it so the program does what you wish. This way you decide and not the developer for you. If you use a program without freedom one, you not only can't change it, you can't even tell what it's actually doing to you. Many non-free programs contain malicious features designed, for instance, to spy on the user, restrict the user, even attack the user. Spyware is quite common. One non-free program you may have heard of that spies on the user is called Microsoft Windows. <laughs> When the user of Windows, and I won't say you because I'm sure you wouldn't use a nasty program like this. When the user of Windows uses the menu feature to search her own files for a word, Windows sends a message saying what word was searched for. That's one spy feature. But there's another. When Windows XP asks for an upgrade, it sends Microsoft a list of all the programs installed in the machine. Another spy feature, but Microsoft never announced these spy features. People found them through investigation. Of course, that's not totally reliable. There could be other spy features in Windows that people haven't found yet. We only know that there are at least these two. But spying on the user is not limited to Windows. Windows Media Player also spies on the user. 
In fact, it does total surveillance. It reports whatever the user looks at. But please don't think that Microsoft is uniquely evil and only Microsoft would do something so nasty because, in fact, real player spies on the user the same way. And we're pretty sure real player did it first. After all, Microsoft is more known for imitation than for invention. <laughs> Spyware is quite common, but it gets worse than that. There is also the functionality of refusing to function, where the program says, I don't want to let you see the contents of this file, even though it's in your computer. I don't want to let you copy part of this file, even though it's in your computer. I don't want to print this file for you, because I don't like you. <laughs> and I was never put here to serve you. I'm not your servant, I'm your jailer. I'm here to control you and restrict you. I'm working for someone else. That's what those programs say. These features designed to restrict the user are known as Digital Restrictions Management, or DRM. The intentional malicious feature of refusing to function for you. Many companies do this. Microsoft does this. Apple does this. Adobe does this, Google does this, Amazon does this, Sony does this, and many others. It's such a big problem that we've launched a campaign of protests against digital restrictions management. It's in the site defectivebydesign.org because these products are all designed not to work right. They're all designed to hurt you instead of serving you. I wonder if there's a way I can get the screen off, screen up. <coughs> so I can write this down. management attacks your freedom at two levels at once. Its purpose is to take away your freedoms in accessing your copies of published works, to deny you the possibility of doing things that normally under copyright law would be your legal right. And at another level, it's designed to force you to use proprietary software to use those works at all. It's because, first of all, they use a secret encrypted format for the, to publish the works. And by keeping it secret, they hope to prevent us from ever developing free software that can access them. But if we succeed in figuring out the format and developing free software, then their next stage is to make that free software illegal. And that is the case in the US. The US practices censorship of software. For instance, DVDs are an instance of digital restrictions management. The movie is encrypted. And originally that format was secret, but then people figured it out and published free software to, that you could use to watch a DVD. But the distribution of that software in the US is illegal. Oh, you can find it, it's not very hard. <laughs> but Formally speaking, it's forbidden, and therefore many sites do not have it. They, it's a semi-underground. And thus, we ask you, please, to stand up for your own freedom, reject DRM. Never buy any product with DRM unless you personally possess the means to break the DRM. So if you have a copy of the free program to play a DVD, then it's okay to buy DVDs or rent DVDs. But otherwise, you should never do so. 
Windows Vista is a tremendous advance in restricting the user. That appears to be its principal purpose. <laughs> in fact, Microsoft decided to, or, to force users to throw away perfectly good hardware, which wasn't designed to restrict the users, and replace it with new hardware that was. Thus, the Green Party joined with the Free Software Foundation to condemn Windows Vista. <laughs> In fact, Windows Vista is so nasty that we actually have a special campaign urging people not to downgrade to Vista, <laughs> which you can find in the site badvista.org. It shows the ugly Vista that lies before you as a user of Windows Vista. Of course, all versions of Microsoft Windows are proprietary software. They're all unethical fundamentally. And you can't live in freedom using any version of Windows. And so Windows users need to defenestrate their computers, which means either throw Windows out of the computer or throw the computer out the window. <laughs> <coughs> Although the Green Party would prefer the former. <clears throat> but those who are not ready to make the move to freedom just yet, at least they shouldn't make things worse for themselves by downgrading to Vista. And that's the purpose of badvista.org. But it gets even worse. There are also the malicious features designed to attack the user, back doors. One proprietary program that has a back door that you may have heard of is called Microsoft Windows. <laughs> you see, starting with Windows XP, Microsoft made arrangements to find out the user's identity, which means that when Windows XP asks for an upgrade, Microsoft can deliver to that user an upgrade designed specifically for him, which means Microsoft can take control of his computer and wipe the floor with him, and the user has no recourse. That's a backdoor whose existence we can deduce from known facts. Are there others? A few years ago in India, I was told that they had arrested some of the developers of Windows and accused them of working in parallel for Microsoft and Al-Qaeda, <laughs> installing another backdoor that Microsoft wasn't supposed to know about. That attempt apparently failed. Was there another that succeeded? We can't check. But we know that Microsoft itself installed a backdoor for the use of an even more violent terrorist organization, the United States government. This was in a piece of server software. It was, a, it was set up for the use of the NSA, and it was found in 1999. And this shows that you can never trust a, a program without freedom one. You can never be sure it doesn't have malicious features. Now, with Windows XP, the user has the option of turning off all upgrades. Now, in order to do that effectively, one needs to completely turn off the update upgrade facility. Otherwise, Microsoft actually can impose changes in software whenever it wishes. I believe, as, as far as I know, they can't do that if the upgrade facility is totally turned off. Of course, that could be dangerous in other ways, considering what Windows security is like. <laughs> but <clears throat> at least it's a possibility. So, of course, with Windows Vista, they got rid of that possibility. Windows Vista allows Microsoft to forcibly change the software at any time. But please don't think that Microsoft is uniquely evil and only Microsoft would do this. I'm told that Mac OS X is exactly the same. So it's an understatement to say that Microsoft and Apple can take control of the user's computer because they always have total control. They have grabbed control from the very first moment the user starts to use the computer. What one 
once would have been scandalous is now accepted by the sheep. So this shows that a program without freedom won demands blind faith on the part of the user because there's no other basis for using it. And we can divide these programs into two categories. There are the ones that in which we know of malicious features, and then there are the ones in which we don't know of any malicious features. Now, some of them have malicious features, and some don't have it. But we can't tell which is which. The only way we can ever be certain is when we find a malicious feature, and that is the program over here. But I'm sure there are plenty of, of these programs that have no malicious features. And even though I can't identify any one of them, I can make a statement about all of them. And that is, their developers are humans. They make mistakes. The code of those programs has bugs. And the user of a program without freedom one is just as helpless facing an accidental bug as facing an intentional malicious feature. If you use a program without freedom one, you're a prisoner of your software. We, the developers of free software, are also human. We also make mistakes, and the code of our free programs also has bugs. But if you find a bug in our code, or anything in our code that you don't like, you're free to change it. Because we don't keep you prisoner. We can't be perfect. We can respect your freedom. And there is all the difference. But freedom one is not enough. Because that's the freedom to personally study and change the source code. And there are millions of users that don't know how to program, so they can't personally exercise freedom one. Even for programmers like me, freedom one is not enough. Because there's too much software in the world. There's too much free software already in the world for any one person to study and master all the source code and personally make all the changes that she might want. That's too much for one person. So the only way we can fully take control of our computing is to do it working together, cooperating. And for that, we need freedom free. The freedom to contribute to your community. The freedom to make and distribute copies of your modified version when you wish. This allows us to cooperate. Because one person can take a free program and make a change and release that modified version. And someone else can start with that and make a further change and release that version. And someone else can start with there and make a further change and release that version. And afterward, retrospectively, we will say that they cooperated to make certain improvements. Although they may not have had a specific intention to cooperate with each other beforehand. But Oh, that would be the effect of what they did. So, the result is that the users are in control. <clears throat> and all the users get the benefit of the four freedoms. Suppose there are a million users of a free program that want a certain change. We can expect a few thousand of them will know how to program. And one day, a few of them will make the change, release their modified version, and then all those million users can install it, including the ones that couldn't have written it themselves, and including the others that could have written it themselves, but they didn't have to because somebody else did. And thus, all the users get the benefit of the four freedoms. Every user can exercise freedom zero and two, the freedom to run the program as you wish, and the freedom to distribute exact copies. Those don't require programming. Freedoms one and three do entail programming. Freedom one, the freedom to study and change the source code. And freedom three, the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions when you wish. Those entail programming. So any given user can exercise these freedoms more or less depending on how much he knows how to program. But when some people, the programmers, exercise these freedoms and release their modified versions, everyone else can install them if they wish. 
So we all get the benefit, even the non-programmers get the benefit of the fact that they're living in a free society <coughs> in which everyone does have the freedom to change the program and release modified versions. And what these four freedoms together give us is democracy. A free program develops democratically under the control of its users. All the users can participate in society's decision about the future of the program, which is simply the sum total of all the individual decisions people make about what to do with the program. By contrast, a proprietary program develops under the dictatorship of its developer. The developer decides what it will do and decides what it won't do and imposes that on the users. In fact, the non-free program operates as an instrument for imposing the developer's power on the users. And this is an unjust form of power that no one should have. So on one hand, we have individual freedom, social solidarity, and democracy. On the other, we have a nasty dictatorship. It's clear that, ethically speaking, software should be free and non-free software shouldn't happen. That is free software from an ethical perspective, which is the most important perspective of all. But there's another perspective that people may be interested in, and that is the perspective of business. How does free software affect business? Well, the businesses that develop software are a tiny fraction, but lots of businesses in advanced countries use software. And as users of software, they need the four freedoms just as an individual in other areas of his life needs the four freedoms. So free software is therefore extremely good for business, generally speaking. And businesses can very well take advantage of the four freedoms to get what they want, even if they don't have any programming skills. Suppose there are a thousand users of a free program that want some change, but none of them knows how to program, so they can't do it themselves. They can take advantage of the four freedoms to get the change they want. Now, as long as they have some money, they could be businesses, they could just be individuals, but either way, they can do this. Namely, one of them can make an announcement, does anybody else want this? And the others can respond so they can get in touch with each other. And then they can start an organization. The idea is they join it, they pay dues, and this way the organization collects money with which to pay for the change. So for instance, if it is a medium-sized change, it might take a month of work for a programmer who's skilled in that area. Well, that might cost $10,000, so the organization could ask each of these thousand users, please pay $10. Every one of you, I'm sure, could afford to pay $10 if that would enable making a change that you'd appreciate. But suppose it were a bigger change. It might take a year of work. Well, then it might cost $100,000. So the organization would say, please, make, please pay $100 to join. But, you know, if a change that big is desired by businesses, it's probably going to save each of them a lot more than $100. So they'd be very happy to put in their $100 to make it happen. The organization will have to decide what to hire. So we'll ask one group of programmers, when could you do this? What would you charge? Please show us your portfolio. And then we'll ask another group and another group and so on and then decide, which illustrates an interesting fact that free software brings with it a free market for all kinds of support and services. By contrast, support for proprietary software is normally a monopoly. Only the developer has the source code, so only the developer can make a change. The user that wants to change has to beg and pray, oh, almighty developer, please make this change for me. Some developers say, pay us and we'll listen to your problem. <laughs> if the developer does this, sorry, if the user does this, the developer then says, thank you, in six months there will be an upgrade. 
buy it and you'll see if we fixed your problem and you'll see what new problems we have in store for you. <laughs>
through technical work. All I had, to, I was an operating system developer. That was what I'd been doing for something like 13 years. And all I had to do was develop another operating system that I, as the author, could make it free, and everyone would then be able to use computers in freedom. So I had come up with a way to eliminate a social problem through technical work. I was aware of this important and growing social problem, which most people didn't recognize as a problem. I had the skills and capacity necessary to try to eliminate this problem, and it looked like nobody would do it if I did not. Nobody else was talking about it. So that meant I had been elected by circumstances to do this work. It was my duty. It's as if you see someone drowning, and you know how to swim, and there's no one else around, and it's not Bush, <laughs> <laughs> or anyone else that supports the conquest of Iraq, then you have a moral duty to save that person. software. That was our way of life. Whatever we wrote, whatever we had, 
we would share with other people. And we were programming primarily for the uh, for the fascination of programming. Now it's true that many of us were employees, and the uh, and the rest were mostly students. But that was all secondary. It was the fascination of programming above all. And to make it even more fun, we would often give funny or mischievous names to our programs. Because that way, you could have even more fun imagining the users laughing at the name. In the 1970s, system programming was usually not portable. Every program was written typically for one kind of machine. So it was quite common that you would see an interesting program, and you'd say, I'd like to be able to do that. But it was written for a different kind of machine, so it couldn't run on computer. And the only way you could do that was to write another program to do the job. This was normal. In our community, when we did this, we had a particular custom, a funny custom, that you could give your program a name which was a recursive acronym saying that your program was not the other program. It's a humorous way of giving credit. So, for instance, in 1976, I developed the first Emacs text editor, which was an extensible programmable text editor. And after that, there were about 30 imitations, typically written for different machines. Uh, and some of them were called such and such Emacs, which is the obvious, not funny way to name them. But there was also fine, for fine is not Emacs. And sign, for sign is not Emacs. And Ina for Ina is not Emacs. And Mince for Mince is not complete Emacs. <laughs> and version 2 of Ina was called Psy, for Psy was Ina initial. <laughs> so you can have lots of fun with recursive acronyms. And of course, I look for a recursive acronym for something is not units, blank, I, and U. But there was nothing of that form that was a word. And if it doesn't have another meaning, it's not funny. What good is that? <laughs> what can I do? Well, I thought I could make a contraction and get rid of the I. I have blanks, not units. Or blank, and U. So I started trying every initial. A new, 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 new. Well, new is the most humor charged word in the English language. <laughs> Used for countless word plays. Because according to the dictionary, the G is silent and it's pronounced new. So anytime you want to write the word new, you can spell it G-N-U when you've got a joke. <laughs> Maybe not a very good joke. <laughs> but there are lots of them. And once in a while, it is a good joke. When I was a child, there was a funny song based on the word new. So given a specific, meaningful reason to use GNU as the name for a programming project, I couldn't use it. <laughs> However, when it's the name of our operating system, please do not obey the dictionary. If you talk about the new operating system, you'll get people confused. Because we've been working on it for 24 years now, <laughs> and we've been using it for 15 or so, so it's not new anymore. But it still is GNU. And it always will be GNU, no matter how many people mistakenly call it Linux. <laughs> but how would a bizarre mistake like that get started anyway? It has to do with the history of the system. See, during the 80s, our work in the GNU project was to develop all of these components that we couldn't find from someplace else. And by 1990, we had just about all of them, but one major essential component was missing. And that was the kernel, which is the program that allocates the machine's resources to all the other programs you run. In 1990, we started developing the kernel. I chose the design. I chose to use, as the bottom half, a program called MAC, which was a so-called microkernel that had been developed as a funded university project. So we would only have to write the top half. Well, that's half of the job saved already. And this, we figured we would do it as a collection of modular server programs, each one providing one of the services of the Unix kernel. And they would work together 
by sending messages, and they would run in user space, so we could debug them with an ordinary source level debugger. And I figured that way, we would be able to get them running quickly, and the whole job, I thought, would be done soon. The Free Software Foundation hired somebody to write this, and I didn't do it myself. I don't know why it took so long, but in fact, it took us many years to get it to run at all. And it still doesn't work very well, so I wouldn't recommend you use it. But that's sad, but it was not a disaster, because we didn't have to wait for it. In 1991, a college student named Torvalds developed the kernel using the usual monolithic design, and he got it to barely work in less than a year. This kernel was called Linux, and initially it was not free software. The license of the first release was too restrictive to qualify as free software. However, in 1992, he changed the license and adopted the GNU General Public License, or GNU GPL, which is one among several free software licenses. And that meant Linux was free software. And thus, the combination of the almost complete GNU system plus Linux, the kernel, made a complete free operating system. And the goal we had set out for almost a decade earlier had been reached. The development of Linux, followed by its release as free software, was an important contribution to the free software community. It was the step that carried us across the finish line. Of course, the last step in a race is not the only step that matters, far from it. The reason that one step was able to carry us across the finish line is that we've taken so many already. But nonetheless, it was an important contribution. However, there were people who saw that one step and ignored all the steps before it. When people started using this combination of GNU plus Linux, the people who made these combinations at first started calling them Linux systems. And that led many people to think that Torvalds had done all the work, that it all came from him, and basically to ignore the fact that really it mostly came from GNU more than anywhere else. <clears throat> so the result is that now there are millions of people that use this variant of the GNU system, and they mostly have no idea that it's a variant of the GNU system. They think it's Linux. They think it was started in 1991 by Mr. Torvalds. Well, this is obviously not fair. So I ask you, please, call the system GNU slash Linux, or GNU plus Linux. It was equal mention. Since we started the whole thing and we did the biggest part of the work, I think that we have a good case to deserve equal mention, and that's all we ask for. But I have to recognize that credit is not the most important moral issue in life. And if it were only a matter of credit, it wouldn't be worth making a fuss about. But there's something much more important at stake here in your decision about what name you're going to call the system. Your freedom is at stake indirectly. Because obviously, your choice of names has no direct effect on much of anything. But when you choose what words to use, you choose what meanings to express. You choose what to teach others. And by which way you lead them, you have an effect on what they will do. The name GNU has always been associated with these ideas of the free software movement. After all, I launched the GNU project specifically for the sake of achieving freedom. The name Linux is associated with a different set of ideas, the ideas of Mr. Torvalds who developed it. And he doesn't agree with the ideas of the free software movement, and he never did. He's made it quite clear that what he values most is powerful, reliable software, and that he doesn't believe that users of software are entitled to any particular freedoms. Well, he has a right to his views has a right to promote them. I respect that right, even though I think he's mistaken. But he doesn't have a right 
to use our colossal work as a platform for his views while people who benefit from our work don't know it's ours. That shouldn't happen. And if it does happen, it puts all of our freedom in danger. You see, history shows that freedom is frequently threatened. And if people fail to defend their freedom, they're likely to lose it. Just look at the United States as an example, where in recent years, fundamental human rights have been taken away from us by our own leaders who claimed that they were doing this to protect us from other secondary enemies. And that applies to the freedom of software users just as it applies to the rest of life. But at least in the rest of life, the discussion about human rights has gone on for centuries. Centuries to debate the question of which human rights people are entitled to and to spread conclusions around the world. That doesn't mean we always succeed in defending human rights. But at least it gives us a base with, with, from which to try. But we don't have that in computing. In order for people to defend their freedom, they have to appreciate their freedom. And in order for them to appreciate it, they have to know the concept. And in computing, for, when it comes to the question of the freedoms that a user or software is entitled to, most people have never even thought that the question and never even turned their attention to the question. They never even heard the idea that perhaps they might be entitled to certain human rights as users of a program. I claim to have identified four of them. The four essential freedoms that, design, that define free software are the human rights that every software user is entitled to. But we haven't had much of a debate about this subject as a society. Because computing is a fairly new area of life. It's only 15 years or so since most of the people in this country began using computers. And most of the world is less. Which is not much time to have a debate, even if you try. But our society mostly has not tried. It simply allowed the developers of proprietary software to dictate the answer and took that for granted. Most people who use computers started using them with proprietary software, surrounded by other users of proprietary software, and they took for granted that that was the way it should be. So, for the most part, most computer users have never thought that there might even be a question to debate. We, in the free software movement, try to raise this debate at every opportunity. But nowadays, even most of the people who use the GNU plus Linux system have never even heard of these ideas. Because they don't know that the system is GNU. The name GNU has always been associated with these ideas, but they don't know that they're using the GNU system. They don't know it is the GNU system. They think the system is Linux and they associate it with the ideas that came from Torvalds. They also don't hear the term free software, most of them. Because the people who agree with Torvalds, about 10 years ago, they came up with a different term to use. They use the term, quote, open source, unquote. And the reason they use it is that it was not associated with us or any of our ideas, so they could define its message and they chose to leave out the basic level of freedom when they defined the meaning of open source. That's why I never describe my work as open source. I, I want to promote awareness of freedom. I want to lead people to fight for their freedom. And you don't do that by talking about, quote, open source, unquote. in our community of freedom makes our community weak 
makes our community vulnerable to losing its freedom through lack of attention. And this has happened. This is not just a theoretical danger. For instance, since sometime in the 90s, hardware companies started making devices and keeping the interface specifications of them secret. So they would sell you something you could put into your PC, but they wouldn't tell you how to use it. Instead, they would offer you a non-free program to control it with. And they would say, oh, we support Linux. And when they say Linux, they mean the GNU slash Linux system. And when they say support, they mean you can run it, but you have to give up your freedom. Because all they offer you is a binary only <coughs> controller. And if you install that, you're giving up your freedom. So this is a big problem for our community. How do we maintain our freedom? against this problem? Well, some of us have to do the difficult job of reverse engineering to figure out what commands to send to that hardware so that they can write free software to do it. And the rest of us have to put pressure on those companies by criticizing them publicly and not buying from them. There are tens of millions of users of Windows slash Linux. If we all use our market power, we would have a lot of it. But most of our community has never even thought about the question of whether there's anything bad about these non-free drivers. So they just use them and don't think about it. We fail to use our strength. And because of this, we lose battles we can easily win. But it gets worse than that. In 1992, when Linux filled the last gap in the GNU system, and the first GNU slash Linux versions were available, we had a complete free operating system. But a few years later, when there were several different distributions of GNU slash Linux, different versions of the system as a whole, some of the developers of these distributions started putting in non-free applications. And they said, to the users, look what we get with our distribution, this attractive program, this attractive program. What a bonus. So these programs were bad because they deny the users freedom, but they presented them as good. And what message did that say to the public? It said, non-free programs are good. Well, the developer of another distribution looked at that and said, oh, oh we have to compete with them. And they are attracting more users because of those non-free applications. We better put them in, too. And so they said, they started saying, look what you get with our distribution, these wonderful non-free programs, these wonderful programs. They didn't mention non-free. They didn't usually tell, they didn't usually try to focus the user's attention on this issue at all. Just the opposite. They were trying to distract attention from this issue. And I said to them sometimes, you know, you really shouldn't do this because it defeats the whole purpose of developing a free operating system to add something not free to it. And they said, well, we wish we could get rid of these. And as soon as you give us a nice free program to replace it with, we will, re we will replace it. Which from my point of view was saying, we won't move a muscle to do anything about the problem we've caused. We'll wait for you to clean up our mess. But this problem got worse and worse until by the year 2000, there were essentially no free distributions of people slash Linux. 